position of the body, orientation of the body, the injury, matches up directly with the defendant's home. That's the injury wound caused by the projectile, which matches up with the defendant's home. That's the picture rolled over, Gabriel rolled over, hand clenching his chest, I've been shot, falls forward and dies. That injury breaks three ribs, perforates the right lung, three lobes of the right lung, and severs the aorta. You're not moving after severing the aorta. You're done. Life is over. Let's picture a drone. We're going to walk through it. Saw so the cones. That's the estimated by Detective Bunting where the shooter was standing. We're going to go past one fence line. We're going to pass a second fence line. This is a distance here. 115 yards. And we're going to see some red cones here where the victim's body was located. And we all stood out there on that site. Camera's going to pivot. You heard from GPS that they took the drone footage and put it on a mapping of some sort and it gives us this GPS mapping. The blue line on the left hand side, that's a north-south directional line. The red one, east and west. And that green line is the patio to the victim's body. And that's the orientation of the victim's body. And we'll say it again, matches perfectly for the patio to the victim, the orientation of the body, the defendant shot nine times. <coughs> He's been charged, secondary murder, and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Secondary murder, you heard from Ms. Hunley in the opening, is a unified offense. There's three ways to prove it. You don't have to agree on all three ways, but you have to agree on secondary murder. First way, Kelly intentionally caused Gabriel's death. He walk out on a patio and point a gun at someone and shoot nine times. That's intent. Kelly caused Gabriel's death by conduct Kelly knew would cause the death or serious physical injury. An AK-47 is a serious weapon. It's not a play toy. When you fire it nine times at a human being, it's a serious activity. Third, under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to human life, Kelly recklessly engaged in conduct that created a grave risk of death and thereby caused Gabriel's death. The risk must be such that disregarding it was a gross deviation from what a reasonable person in the defendant's situation would have done. Two men walking southbound, no danger to you, and you don't want to give a warning? Hey, get off my property. Get off my property. Or just sit back and let them continue on. Facts of this case. Gabriel and Daniel were shot at. Gabriel is dead killed by a high-powered weapon. An AK-47 is such a weapon. Kelly wound is to the right side back, exit wound, the chest, consistent with the direction of the defendant's home. 
defendant's words on his dispatch or BP to dispatch to officers and during Detective Ianza's interview, inconsistent. Every single time the story changed. Every single time the story changed. Daniel's words, consistent. Her an AK-47, horse saved his life, heading southbound. I just want to repeat real quick since we're on Daniel. Daniel's the only one in this courtroom, on this hill, and likely in the city of Nogales, who's ever been shot at with an AK-47 nine times and be next to a friend who just died. So maybe, during his testimony, distance and time is a little skewed. Just maybe. But he knows it's an AK-47, he knows it's a red horse to save him, and he's heading southbound. Defendant steps out, no verbal warning. Defendant shot his AK-47 nine times. There's show casings found with the ejection pattern that matches what DPS forensic scientist Burnell is consistent with the ejection patterns and positive, I mean, position orientation of the body once again matches up with only one known shooter. In front of instruction, there is also a lesser included. So if you do not find, beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant caused secondary murder, you can consider manslaughter. And manslaughter, as a, as a judge read, and you'll have jury instructions, and we'll spend too much time on this, but it requires proof the defendant caused the death of another person, and the defendant was aware of and showed a conscious disregard of a substantial and unjustifiable risk of death. Stepping on a patio with an AK-47, shooting at two armed men, walking southbound, no danger to you. And if you don't find secondary murder, and you don't find manslaughter, you can consider negligent homicide. Negligent homicide requires proof of the defendant caused the death of another person, the defendant failed to recognize a substantial and unjustifiable risk of causing the death of another person. Aggravated assault, second charge. Aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The defendant committed an assault against Daniel. And the defendant used a deadly weapon in AK-47. Assault requires the defendant intentionally puts Daniel in a reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. Steps outside with an AK-47. And shoots that gun. And that's the horse. According to Daniel, saved his life. He recognized that horse. He identified that horse. That's the defendant's horse. And that horse was between him and the Kelly's residence. Defendant's words. I'm not admitting to anything I've done, but all those things tend to add up. And they do. We're moving the wheat from the shaft here. Agent Marcel, first witness for the state. 2.30 phone call. I'm going to summarize these for you. First phone call. I'm being shot at. I'm shooting back. There are five people, all packs, with, with packs running southbound. I'm being shot at, and I'm shooting back. Five individuals in this story. That's at 2.30 in the afternoon. Six minutes later, defendant changes that story. I had an altercation with someone. I heard a gunshot in his direction, in my direction. Inspected his horse while they spoke. I'm going to argue he inspected his horse because he shot his gun nine times. He wanted to make sure he didn't shoot his own horse. We were too far to tell if they, any of them had firearms. And that's probably the most truthful thing he says here. Because you were out there, 115 yards is pretty dang far away. 
to see a firearm on an individual. 2.40, 10 minutes after that first phone call. And what's happening in the background with 2.30 is BP is now communicating to SO Dispatch. And SO Dispatch is doing a code 3 alert and lights and sirens going off and all SO people are responding to scene because to them, they think it's an active shooter. And we want law enforcement to believe when we call them, we want them to believe the story. They're not here to second guess it. So lights and sirens are going. And 10 minutes after that phone call, respond, active shooter response. You heard testimony. Goal is number one, preservation of life. BP locates a defendant near his barn. And you heard Agent Heredia on the stand. He appeared calm. 10 minutes after being shots fired, I'm shooting back, the defendant is calm. He's calm. He's carrying an AK-47, walking with his two labs. No one located on the property on a security sweep. No one. 3 p.m., defendant says, people were possibly carrying rifles. Possibly now. We went from, I'm in a shootout, to too far to tell, and now maybe not, maybe so. They were 100 to 150 yards away from his property. Castaneda told the defendant that if anything like this happened again, don't do anything, call 911, stay in your house. And his response, understood it. He said, I want to do what he had to do to protect his property. He was conscious of the consequences he would take responsibility for his actions. Talking to BP and SO, the defendant never admits that he shot his AK-47. We've got Border Patrol and agents on scene for an active shooter situation, and you fail to tell them that you shot your own weapon? Never told law enforcement that, he, that anyone pointed a gun at him. Didn't tell anyone. This just happened. This literally just happened. And you're not telling a single soul that people were shooting at you? Never told law enforcement he was in fear of his life. 423, he's calling. I think this is a thank you call for Agent Marcel to get a quick response to him. And this call... He says, now, instead of five folks, we have 10 to 15, all loaded with AR-style rifles. We're getting exaggerated statement here now. 523, this is the second wave of phone calls. That was the first wave, the active shooter call, and now we got the calls and dispatch recording related to Gabriel's body. Jeremy, this is Alan Kelly. You need to call me immediately. This is serious. Call me immediately. I can't say more on the phone. Why can't you say more on the phone? Why can't you say more on the phone? 526, he sends that text message. 535, here comes the fourth phone call. This is worse than you can imagine. This is bad. Marcel told Kelly, call 911 and talk to the SO. He never does. He never calls the SO. The SO calls him. Because Marcel does what a border patrol agent is supposed to do. If there's an immediate emergency, he routes a call to the, the local law enforcement, which is the SO. And the SO then, without him calling, calls him to, ver to find out what's going on. What's so serious? And why immediate response again? You know how shots were fired, fired earlier? Something was possibly struck. Just say, there's a body on my property. Just say it. When Marcel asked for additional details, Kelly said, I can't tell you over the phone. Ask Marcel, 
that this was being reported. It's a noteworthy question right there. This is that dispatch call. Do I have my microphone? Okay. 
Can you tell me a description of is the vehicle? Well, I, I don't I don't have a description. There's not a vehicle. Okay. Uh, the only thing that I was referring to in conjunction it's with that accident was was the body. Okay. You got it? Okay. All right. What, yeah. Okay. Can I have your name? Yes, George Kelly. George Kelly. Okay, George, would you, if my deputy goes over there, would you take him to whatever it yes, is that you yes, found? Yes, I have it marked. I have a flashlight on over it because uh, it's going to be dark when he gets here probably, but I'll take it to him. Uh, just. Uh, and you are sure an EMT cannot help? I am positive. I have a medical background. An EMT cannot help. Do you know whoever it is that you saw? No, I do not know. I didn't say it was anybody. I just said it was a body. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be smart, ma'am. I'm oh, just I trying understand. to. I understand. You're trying to be careful, and I get that. However, um, I hope you understand that on my end, I have to take care of my deputies, too. So I'm yes, just going to a little bit more context as to why you needed a deputy to head out there. It's now you know that, that there is a body here. Okay. All right. Does it look um, somewhere? It, it's not alive. So you asked, did you need an EMT? I said, no. Okay. I'm sure a coroner, a coroner will be involved sooner or later. I just said, uh, George, can you tell me something? Um, is it discolored from somewhere? Is it discolored? Yes. What does that mean? Um, has it been there for a while? Can you tell? Uh, from from what in that in that I only approached the body to make sure that the animal uh, is not a vegetable or a mineral. The okay. animal wasn't alive and it was not alive. Okay. Although, there were no signs. There was no signs of blood. Uh, there was just a, uh, a, a an animal leg face down. An animal. An animal, and you know what an animal is, is not a vegetable or a mineral. Okay. It's a body, and you know what I'm talking about. I understand what you're talking about, George. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to send the deputy then over to your house so you can meet them over to where, where you found what it is. Okay. Found, okay? And now, yeah, maybe one of the deputies around here, they know how to get here because it's one under a water call circle, and it's kind of hard to find. It's a rat right on the border. So, so how about if I get these that we spotted earlier going over your way? That's good. You do that. They know how to get here, and I'll have to get it over. Okay. Sounds good, George. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate your help and your patience, and I'm sorry if no I... No problem. I am, sir. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thank you. That's a phone call I so had to make to the defendant. And it says, it's very serious. Recap. Very serious. Can't tell am I going to talk over the telephone. I don't want to get me in trouble. I'm not, I'm not admitting to anything I've done, but all those things tend to add up. Tepa Lopez gets on scene, that's Exhibit 38. I'm not going to play that for you, but that's admitted into evidence. That's that recording that, detect, that Agent, I mean, Deputy Lopez recorded. He says in that, quote, Defendant, I have no idea, I have no idea, I have no idea. And you know, if you were me, you got no idea. You know what I'm saying? You literally shot your gun nine times, and you got no idea what possibly could have happened. Sergeant Rodriguez gets on scene, 615. Sergeant Rodriguez is the one that pronounces Gabriel dead. That's not the time of death. That's the pronouncement of death by law enforcement. No pulse. Extremities are cold, but his torso was still a little warm. Importantly, there's no drag marks, blood trails, or foot traffic evidence anywhere. It appeared as though Gabriel fell where he was shot. At this point, Sergeant Rodriguez does not know Dr. Tim's autopsy results, a severed aorta. That's a drop shot. 
you're going down. The entry wound lined up with the east patio of the Kelly residence. Again, entry wound and orientation lines up. And then, it, and then the defendant has an interview with Detective Ainza. In that question, he says, question, did you shoot? I have no reason to believe I shot this person. Ainza, what does that mean? Defendant, it means I have no reason to believe I shot him. That's simple. Question, did you shoot? No response. No response. Detective Ainza, at this stage, has already talked to Border Patrol. He's already talked to Dispatch. He's already talked to SO. So Detective Ainza has information. In doing an interview, he's not going to disclose the information. He wants the defendant to talk to him. Then it does not say he shot his weapon. And until 30 minutes into this interview, about 50 minute interview, he finally does. And that's the trend. this is the interaction. Look at me, look at me. I can see it in your eyes. Defendant, I haven't said I didn't shoot. Did you shoot? No response. Towards these gentlemen. No, I did not shoot at those gentlemen. Did you shoot? All he touched my hands is trying to figure out is, did you shoot? And finally he says, yes. Then he says, I shot over their heads. Shot over their heads. He shoots in their direction, says it this time. I need to ask if it's 100, 150 yards away. He affirms that. And he says, they were armed. Remember an earlier statement, too far to tell? You were out there. And I shot 100 yards over their heads. I didn't shoot at them, I shot over their heads. And you shot towards the direction of their heads? Yes. Does not admit he shot his AK-47 until 30 minutes into that interview. <laughs> you saw pictures of the shell casings. You're out unseen. Right next to, if I'm on the patio, they're right to my right. Eight shell casings found. And those are the nine total. One in blue found by the ATF K-9. K-9 alerted the evening of. That's around... 12.30 in the morning, and the next day when it's light out, they found the other eight shell casings in yellow. And the ejection pattern, as we're going to see in a second here, is consistent with the ejection pattern of DPS forensic scientist Brunel's review of that weapon shooting the exact same rounds. We get to the AK-47. Where was this gun? Where was this gun that he keeps by the patio door? It was hanging up on a coat rack on a bedroom door behind a sweatshirt. And the only reason it was found was Sergeant Flores opens the door. The door stops his momentum, but the gun continued and bumped the back of the door. He looks behind the door and sees this weapon. What's not true in this case? What's not? There is no evidence of a mysterious shot. None. The only person in this courtroom who has ever said anything about a mysterious shot is the defendant. His wife doesn't even say she heard a shot. And you heard when Ms. Hunley had Ms. Ms. Kelly on the stand, you wonder why we asked the question, what were you watching? I was watching a news show. What was the volume? It was on 20 out of a range of 100. You're in your living room. 
your husband's in the kitchen, he hears a gunshot, and you don't. And you're watching and listening to news at a medium volume. That's a mysterious, magical gunshot in this case. No evidence that it exists. None. The other one is the boogeyman. We've got a lot of armed men on the property. It went from 5 to 10 to 15, all carrying packs, all with rifles, walking this property. And they changed the number. They changed the distance. They're creating a, a fear here of the boogeyman being there. There's no evidence. None. We have two migrants come to the U.S., hang back to Mexico, who get shot at. Defendant under fire. No evidence whatsoever. They did a search with a metal detector from the house to the victim, no other shell casings, and from the victim out, no round or other shell casings. None. No damage to the house. If you're being shot at, if you're in your house and you're being shot at, where's the damage to the house? No evidence of drug packs or drugs. No evidence of robbery or theft. No evidence of struggling or dragging. None. Someone else must have shot the victim because the victim stumbled over. This is a severed aorta. You don't stumble around. You heard Dr. Tim, you may take one or two steps and may utter a gasping phrase or two, and you're done. During voir dire, I think it was mentioned by counsel that this is a shoddy, I'm paraphrasing, this is a shoddy investigation. Here's everyone involved in this investigation. Local law enforcement, we've got border patrol agents, We've got DPS, we've got outside experts, medical examiner, we've got a guy from Washington, Mr. Wyatt, we've got Ms. Telsell from the East Coast, and we have the FBI. This is a thorough investigation. This is Agent Douglas, who you heard on the stand testify about downloads from the defendant's cell phone. You saw that? AK getting a lot of work. 33 dealt with this week. AK hot. AK hot again. It's either fight or run them too old to run. There's BP cameras out there. Anything like this? Expert witness you saw, I mentioned him earlier, DPS forensic scientist Brudenell, talked about the functionality of that AK-47. It works, it's operable. Talked about the ejection pattern, which is consistent with his testing with the results on the scene. Rounds coming off to the right. Doesn't matter if you're right-handed or left-handed. No matter, the projectiles are coming out of the right hand side of the gun. The injury is consistent with a long range shot. Why do we know that? Well, we have two things we got going on here. We have GSR, we have that cloud from a gun. When you shoot a gun, there's a cloud of particulars that come out. And you heard testimony that usually within 20 feet, some of that cloud dust is going to come on to the person. Well, there is no GSR in this case, which means only other reason is you're further than 20 feet from the victim. That's what it means. This ain't no close range shot of holding a backpack and doing a gangster shout shot. That's not what's going on here. Because there would be a cloud. There'd be gun residue all over that person, all <coughs> over him. There's none. You heard the witnesses, they took damp, they damped the clothes all around and submitted to Ms. Tussell, her testimony, no GSR found, which means further than 20 feet. I think it's easy to say that 115 yards is further than 20 feet. 
We also heard from DNA and fingerprint analysts from D DPS. The reason we did is we, we, we're doing a thorough investigation here. We're demonstrating to you, you deserve to know that the government is doing a thorough investigation. That's, what, that's our job. And there is none. Not surprising. There's only two people involved in this case. Or three, Tom Daniel. Rick Wine, expert from Washington, talk about ballistics, talk about the wound, the bullet used is consistent with the wound, shooting reconstruction, and he talks about the bullet being in yaw. I call it a wobble. It hit something on its way. It hit something on its path. So instead of being like a nice little spiral, it's like a duck, like someone throwing a duck football. It's a little spiral off. When it hits that body, that's why the entry wound's a little off. And you saw the scene, mesquite trees all around, could hit a branch anytime. It was Rick Wyatt who asked SO to go cut that branch. Just to double check. There's no evidence on the branch. It was an indication to you all why the bullet is in y'all. It hit something before it hit. And that's why there's no bullet wipe. Which means when the bullet's carrying some of that particulates on its way, on its journey, and when it enters the body, it's going to leave what we call a bullet wipe. And there is no bullet wipe in this case. Because that bullet is in y'all because it hit something before hitting the, the victim. There's no mystery to that. Ms. Telcell talked about need no GSR found. You heard from Dr. Tim, cause and manner of death, homicide, bullet wound, injury is consistent with an AK type weapon, from collapse to possible step or two, there is no walking with that injury. There is no walking, stumbling around. There is not. Then you, I just want to talk about the skeleton because that's just, that was demonstrative used in this case where defense counsel put the put the, the rod, the trajectory rod, through the skeleton and said that must have been, that must have been the trajectory of that round. That's kind of like a gangster style shooting where you're trying to take the backpack and you're coming up from underneath and you're shooting. You heard Dr. Tim talk about this and you heard Daniel. Possible reason number one, when someone shoots a weapon at you, what's your reaction? To duck. And the moment you duck, you line that body up. You line that body up. And second, you heard Dr. Tim say, once it hits that rib cage, it gets deflected inside the body. There's two reasons why that is the way it is. Not because there's a robbery. Not because there's five guys out there trying to take quote unquote drugs off the victim. Entry wound, like I said, in yaw. Exit wound, come out of the body. It's interesting. Had my gun, shot my gun. He says that 2.30, 2.30 to Border Patrol. Doesn't tell Marcel ever again. He had a couple conversations with Marcel after that. Does not tell him. Does not tell BP Heredia on scene. Had my gun, shot my gun. Does not say that. Does not say to Deputy Monreal on scene. Does not say, had my gun, shot my gun. Does not say it. Castaneda on scene. Does not say, had my gun, shot my gun. These are officers who are responding to a code three. This is lights and sirens. This is an emergency. Does not tell Deputy Lopez, had my gun, shot my gun in this event. Does not tell Sergeant Rodriguez, who is the one who pronounced the victim dead, I had my gun and shot my gun. Does not say anything, nothing. And you wonder why no one's looking for shell casings around the property? Because no one knows, quote, he shot his gun. No one knows that. Because the only person who's talking to Border Patrol is going to be detected by ANSA, and he's here at the station. 
The defendant never says, had my gun, shot my gun. Never. And I that after 30 minutes, he finally admits, had my gun, shot my gun. Dispatch supervisor, Ms. Huerta, defense exhibit JJJ. At 3.05, Border, Border Patrol contacted Wanda Kelly. And Wanda Kelly, according to, according to dispatch, says, my husband's giving chase. Okay. Husband's giving chase. And to their story, there's five armed gunmen with AR-style weapons on my property. There's a shootout, and you're going to take your weapon and go chase them. You heard it on the dispatch log. It's exhibit JJJ. You guys can pull it up. Canines and the defendant and the canines are on scene first. He says, there's a quote, canines disturbing the scene. Canines are at the body. 642, Rodriguez is trying to confirm with Border Patrol the subject struck something. There's no jumping to conclusions. None whatsoever. He's asking for confirmation and he gets confirmation. Deputy Castaneda, this is Wanda's statement when he's on scene. Five individuals, some carrying rifles. Defendant grabs his rifle, he keeps by the door. Not hanging in the bedroom door under a sweatshirt, keeps it by the door. Went outside, her shots outside. Does not say the shots she heard were the defendant's shots. And then he takes off and leaves her to go chase the marauders. The defendant states that they were running south and pursued. <coughs> Importantly, Castaneda on the scene, no rifles, no backpacks, no signs of a large group of five people passing through. None. Agent Marcel, it's important. Agent Marcel told you there's no rip crews in the past 10 years. No AR-15 rifles ever found in the past 10 years. And, this, and if this is being reported, that quote, he said it meant to him, he thought it meant, is this being brushed under the rug? Undocumented migrants, you heard testimony. Migrants, not drug dealers, not gun carrying toting drug guys, but undocumented migrants coming here in the United States for a better life make up 98% of all apprehensions. 98%. All wear, they all wear camo because migrants also don't want to be detected. And they all carry backpacks with food and water. There's no mystery here. Zero, because you have a backpack. None. Migrants use radios for pickups. When they come into the country, they're going to get picked up in a car to get transported. Yes, this is all arranged. We're not dummies here. We know how this works. But having a radio does not mean you're a drug dealer. Having a radio means you're communicating with someone so you can get picked up later on the side of the road. So you can be traveled to Tucson or Phoenix or wherever you're going. Defendant was reluctant to have the SO respond. And cartels, when they get involved, they make things messy. There's no single shot with a cartel. None. Daniel, the victim, an eyewitness. From Honduras, extreme poverty. Counsel, yes, what about do for, uh, you think the jury's been in here since about 9 o'clock, so it's been about an hour and a half. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no problem. we have to take a recess. So we'll take a 20-minute recess. We'll be back here in about um, 10 to 11. Uh, we'll stand at recess until 10.50, 10 to 11. We ride to the floor.